Hello and welcome to Tom Talks. You know me, my name is Nona. I work at the OWOW Center at MSU Denver. And today we have a very special guest. We maybe have the most special guest we've ever had on a Tom Talks before. Today we have my dad, David Shipman. He is gonna be joining us today to talk about his experience working at the USDA and um, how local action can inspire federal regulations and kind of that, the dynamic between the two. And so with that, I will allow our guest to introduce himself. Well, hi, Nona. Uh, Dave Shipman, as she said, uh, I've, I worked at uh, USDA for some 38 years. And while I was there, uh, lots of different positions, but eventually got into leadership positions and uh, worked uh, at the department in the area of facilitating the marketing of agricultural products. Ended up being the administrator of the Agricultural Marketing Service, which has a variety of programs, uh, almost 100 different statutes, laws that were required to be implemented and enforced. And everything from setting up uh, quality standards for different types of agricultural products like grains and oil seeds and fruits and vegetables and animals uh, such as beef and pork and, and so forth. Uh, also got involved with establishing the national organic standards. Lots of involvement with the public to establish those standards. Maybe just a little background on the department at large because a lot of people don't know what the department, they think Department of Agriculture, they think farms. Well, the Department of Agriculture has over 100,000 people working for it. It touches just about everybody's uh, life. Uh, it's actually been called the People's Department, and it was established by uh, President Labor Abraham Lincoln. And back then, it, that department, most people, a majority of the people in the United States actually lived and worked on farms. So it was really important to the economy. Um, but the department has evolved over the years. Uh, the Forest Service, which many people may not know, is part of the department, manages a huge amount of land uh, throughout the country. Um, the Federal uh, Food Safety Inspection Service is part of it, where they have uh, inspectors in just about every one of your food processing plants inspecting for safety. You have APHIS, which is Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. They're responsible for um, addressing diseases uh, through that, that could potentially come in from another country uh, or is already here and has a major impact on agriculture. And so they address those types of things. You have the Food and Nutrition Service, which touches just about everybody. It is the program that uh, administers the F SNAP program, which is known by a lot of people as food, uh, food stamps. It uh, also is involved with the school lunch program and feeding millions of kids every day working in partnership with states. And then it also has the Women with Infant Children's uh, Feeding Program and a variety of other assistance programs, nutritional assistance programs. So the department is pretty diverse. And the segment I worked in was uh, the part that dealt with it facilitating the marketing of, of agricultural products. I'm so glad that you went over kind of all of those different sectors of the USDA, because I think first of all, um, it's probably not something that a lot of people are knowledgeable on is like truly how much the USDA has a hand in. Um, but then also when you actually went into SNAP benefits and, um, and you know, all of the roles within the agricultural community and regulations and all this stuff, it's like, oh, it makes sense why it was, why it was this entity for the people, you know, it not only is trying to help support jobs, but it's also trying to feed a country or, you know, manage imports, exports, all of that. And so like it has, it so strongly tied to people. I know growing up, you know, every once in a while I'd hear these stories um, that you'd bring home from your job. And, um, and there was one specific example that was tied to water and to the agricultural community um, that always kind of stuck with me as a really interesting example of how local voices and actions can influence federal regulations and that whole process. Um, so I was hoping that you could maybe talk about that, that process. Well, let's first start with, you know, how do you actually go about implementing the law once Congress passes it and the president signs it? And there's this thing called the Administrative Procedures Act that was established way back in uh, 1946. And that's kind of the, the roadmap. It's the, the platform that you work from. It tells you uh, what kind of actions you have to take when you're going to implement a 
a law and usually you're promulgating regulations which are the specific guidelines that you have to follow to adhere to that law. So the Administrators Procedures Act, as I said, was 1946 and it requires uh, the government when they're going to promulgate a regulation is that they have to uh, first notify the public that they're going to do it. Okay, then they have to publish a proposal. They receive comments on that proposal. Then they um, will analyze those proposals and in the final rule, or they may go out with another proposal, uh, but as they go through that process, they have to address all the comments that they receive. Mm -hmm. And it's not arbitrary. A government agency can't just arbitrarily uh, establish regulations. There's a process they go through. And if that process isn't followed, or it's not based in some cases, if we're dealing with science, not based on sound science, if it's not based on logic and, um, can, and you don't address all the concerns that are raised by the public regarding the regulation, they can be, that regulation, once it's finalized, can be challenged in the courts. Mm -hmm. And often it is challenged in the courts. And if you don't follow that Administrative Procedures Act, the roadmap that guides you through the process, and adhere to it, your rule can be overturned and mm -hmm. it will be eliminated and you start the whole process over again. It sounds very similar to um, about five, six years ago in Colorado, they uh, finalized what they call the Colorado State Water Plan. And um, there's a handful of other states in the country that have also done this. And essentially the goal of the plan is to address future water concerns with growing populations and climate change and your water right distribution and all of this stuff. And um, in Colorado here, they spent years holding um, you know, open meetings that anyone from the community could attend and express their opinions on how water was being managed, um, you know, how they felt you know, future water should be managed. And then all of that was you know, acknowledged by the state agency, the Colorado Water Conservation Board and responded to, and like you said, if it, fell within the goals of the state water plan, it was then um, included in the plan and ultimately influenced kind of the, the um, outline of what this plan included. How complicated that communication process between the public and the government agency that's dealing with the regulation, it all depends on, on how big a rule it is, how much impact you potentially have. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the Administrative Procedures Act, there's a number of executive orders that are out there that mandate that the agency, for example, depending on the degree of the regulation, how significant it is, you have to do an economic impact statement, you may have to do an environmental impact statement, you may have to do civil rights impact statements, so that you look at all these different aspects of how that regulation may impact the public at large. Mm -hmm. So that, again, you're not just arbitrarily establishing a regulation, you're providing information to the public in advance of the final rule so that they can comment on it. A lot of times rulemaking takes some time and it's messy. It's not necessarily efficient, but hopefully the end result is fair, equitable to the law and you're complying with the intent of the law. So you want to talk a little bit about that example. That all dealt with the grain industry uh, in terms of grain dust and how you control grain dust. And a lot of people don't understand, but grain dust is, is a, a, an explosive material. If, if you have high concentrations of grain dust uh, in a confined space and there's an ignition source, like maybe a conveyor belt bearing that's hot and, and not been maintained properly, and you have a spark and an ignition, you can actually have an explosion occur. In the late 70s, there was some big explosions that occurred right before Christmas, uh, both in Galveston, Texas, and New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, over 50 people died uh, oh, wow. during, those, during those explosions. And a number of them actually worked for the agency that I was working for at the time. And it became a real issue. There were uh, a number of uh, congressional hearings, what happened, there were some special task forces to put together, how, to, you know, why did this happen, how, what measures can be taken. 
obviously the insurance companies that were representing the companies involved wanted to know more about how can this be pre prevented. Uh, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Hazard Administration, part of the federal government um, was concerned about. So a lot of research went into effect and it took a number of years as to how do you prevent these types of mishaps? Um, you know, grain, grain moves in bulk. It, it's a commodity. Um, the moisture level of the grain is especially critical. Uh, and I'll use corn as an example. Um, when you harvest corn, ideally you'd like to leave it in the field until the moisture level of that corn is around 15%. And then when you harvest it, that's a safe moisture level to store it. So folks were looking at, you know, how do we deal with these explosions? And after years of, of uh, research and so forth, the grain industry started to put in pneumatic uh, dust collection systems. They used to have uh, what they call elevator legs. They're like shafts that go vertically and they have, it's like a belt with buckets on it that would lift the grain to a higher level and pour it into a bin. Well, those always created problems. They're very confined. Um, there was all kinds of moving parts that could wear and, and create sparks. And there was a lot of explosions as a result of those elevator legs. So they retrofitted their facility. So they use conveyor belts that were on an incline rather than going straight up, which meaning you needed more land, you needed more property. You, you know, it was an expense, but they made a lot of these investments uh, to try to control the dust. At the same time, uh, a number of companies started playing with the idea, well, can we just mist the grain with a very low level of water so that that dust would stay connected to the grain and not get into the atmosphere and be a potential explosion? Water kept growing in interest. More and more people were thinking, yeah, this is a good way. We, we've made these other investments, but this is even a maybe cheaper way to make that investment. And uh, it started to grow in interest. And again, end users, importers around the world, uh, flour millers, processors, even farmers were starting to express some concern. You know, you know, we go to great lengths to make sure the moisture is just right when we deliver the corn to the marketplace. And, um, and now they're adding water back, you know, that it is, does it have a detrimental impact? Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, some people are, well, you know, are we paying grain prices for water? So there was some real concern about that and it started raising concerns. And so we initially published some rules that said, you know, if you add the water to your grain, you're going to have to label that. It's going to be labeled on any kind of quality certificate that's there so that both buyer and seller understand what, what took place. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an effort to give the industry a tool to self-regulate. It didn't work. It didn't work so well. The concerns still continued. So after that, we decided that, well, we're going to put it, if you add any water to your grain, you've got to put a statement on the certificate that um, water has been applied to your grain. So you're just going to have to do that. And so we did that. And there was some concern that that might work, that might self-regulate. But there was still concern that people were going to misuse this. You know, if a little bit of water suppressed the dust, maybe a little more would do an even better job. And so actually the inspector general at the Department of uh, Agriculture got, in, got involved with some investigations uh, in the Midwest where there was concerns that companies were really abusing this. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, I'll just read you the quote of one of the inspector generals. Um, they did a multi-year investigation and they concluded that the majority of grain elevators applying water, again, not all elevators were applying water, but some were, but they said the majority of the grain elevators applying water to grain have been doing so more to increase gain, uh, grain weight than to legitimately suppress dust. Mm -hmm. And that kind of summarized what was going on. And there mm -hmm. just was this incentive to apply too much. So you had people who um, were at first trying to deal with a potentially dangerous situation with the grain dust 
um, mm -hmm. accumulating and potentially, you know, becoming really dangerous and causing explosions. And so, you know, the original solution was like, let's add oil, let's add water, um, just, just to make it a little bit safer. But then people kind of started, some people, not all people started taking advantage of the situation and upping how much they were adding to the grain to make their, the same quantity of grain weigh more so they ultimately make more money off of it, correct? Correct. And they sold and it. Right. And, and you have to recognize that the grain industry operates on a very, very thin margin. In other words, what they buy something for and what they sell something for, the price doesn't increase much, but they're dealing with such volumes like, like a, a grain ship, you know, may have 2 million bushels of grain on it. And, and you know, so they're handling a huge volume, but only making a little money on every bushel that mm -hmm. they're selling. And uh, if you can increase that weight just a tiny bit, you can make some significant improvements in your financial performance. So Congress actually uh, started holding some hearings. You had both the Senate and the House introduce bills that would have prohibited the uh, addition of water. FDA actually does prohibit the adulteration of food products by the addition of water for the purposes of gaining value but you have to show that the intent is there. And proving intent in this case was much more, much more difficult than you would in, in, in some food additives, okay? So that really was not seen as a viable alternative. Uh, mm -hmm. Congress didn't see it that way. The industry at large didn't see it that way. The Congress didn't really want to pass a law if they didn't have to. So we looked at our regulations and we decided that we did have the authority to actually prohibit the addition of water to grain in actual handling, moving the grain from one location to the other. This was, it wasn't done lightly. It really was, we looked at every opportunity to help the industry self-regulate themselves, give them the tools to do it themselves. But um, I actually had one representative who really does not like government regulations. I can assure you of that. He, he talked to me one day and, and he said, you know, if you don't prohibit this, we all are gonna have to do it because it's such a competitive business that if we don't have rules that prevent us from doing it, we're gonna be forced to do it to stay in the business. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a really stark, message to me. And I think that's why I find this example so interesting is because not only is it scandalous and dangerous, but it's also this, this example of, of people that are in the thick of it, you know, people recognizing that like, this is not a good way to do things, but we, if we don't play this game, we're gonna, we're gonna lose our businesses. We're gonna lose our livelihoods. And so then calling to you know the federal government to the USDA to come in and help with the situation and to and to you know create regulations and rules around this i always thought that was really interesting because i think there's this idea sometimes that um federal regulations are very much from the top down you know and that they can be really based out of the real world sometimes and so i feel like this is such a good example of like no this is something that was happening you know at the local level and there were people participating that said, we don't want to be doing this. We don't want other people to be doing this. We need help. And so really kind of showing that um, the local voices and local actions um, leading to federal regulations and kind of the relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're a capitalist society. And there's always this desire to drive down to the lowest common denominator and make money, right? And if you don't have some basic guidelines, and I don't, it doesn't matter whether it's food quality or it's financial institutions or whatever, if there aren't some basic agreed upon guidelines that you're going to operate under, um, things can go astray. And, and this is just one small example of where I think the community came together on this and tried a number of alternatives before they prohibited it because clearly spraying a little bit of water on grain does suppress dust and is an effective tool. Enforcing it is super easy because once you prohibit it across the board, if somebody down the road is doing it, their competitors are going to find out. 
-hmm. you're going to know that that guy down the road is cheating. And you'd be surprised how quickly that filters through the community and somebody knows and, and a representative can go in there and say, you know, what are you doing and check it out. The marketplace recognizes everybody's got to play by the same rule. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a lot. I think there's definitely a lot of correlations between um, this and water use, water resources um, in the American West. Not long ago, um, a lot of water utilities in urban areas started including snapshots of water use in your neighborhood and how your water use compared to your neighbor's water use. It really motivated people to, to save water more wisely, um, to be more conscious of their water use um, and efficient with it. So at the point in this example that you're providing, um, you have had people come to you, asked for help, you guys have gone through the process of realizing that um, there need to be regulations put into place and trying to figure out what that looks like, how can it be done, all of these things. What ended up being like, what was the ultimate result of all of this? Like how, how is grain processed now in a safe environment? Well, they're, they're ba basically they, they're relying on the investments they made back in the 90s and they continue to this day where they're just using better technology. They've used science and they've engineered how best to handle the product in, in the most safe way as they can. That doesn't mean they've eliminated all the risk. There's still occasionally you know, problems that pop up, but for the most part, it's much safer than it was certainly back in the 70s. This has been really, really great. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this Tom Talks with my dad, David Shipman, um, and we all learned a little bit more about federal regulations and what happens locally and how we can all participate in creating a world that supports our philosophies and our ideologies. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we hope you guys have a great day. Okay, now, um, do, will they know that I'm your dad? I'm gonna say that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna.